So good morning. Welcome and thank you for braving the weather and the early hour to come hear about uh, cloud security and how you can use that to accelerate cloud adoption. So before we begin, just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. First of all, my name is Mark Wood. I'm the uh, Director of Product Management for Dell SecureWorks. And so for those of you who don't know, Dell SecureWorks is a, vision of, a division of Dell that is an information security solutions provider. Uh, historically, that means that we have taken people's, uh, people come to us with a security infrastructure and we'll manage it and monitor it for them. Uh, but we have a wide range of services. If you're interested in finding out more, there'll be some information at the end of the deck that lets you point to uh, uh, more information about the company. Um, so that out of the way, just so you know, uh, this is not a sales pitch. <laughs> this is a discussion about cloud security and some of the things you need to think about as you're making the transition to cloud. And, you know, when I started putting this presentation together, I started to think about all the different ways that people move into cloud. And there's a lot of different scenarios. And see if any of these are, are familiar to you. Well, that would be the wrong way, wouldn't it? Um, so here's how it sometimes goes. Someone in the company says, hey, cloud is faster. Cloud is cheaper, cloud is easier, let's do cloud. And so there's a project that's created and, and to, to, to go to cloud. And they usually in this particular case mean public cloud. I'm not talking about virtualizing your traditional data centers. I'm talking about you know, moving some of your work streams into a, a third party cloud because that's where the, the, uh, some of the interesting security implications are. And so a cloud initiative is created and somewhere along the line, security says, oh, Wow, look what you just did. That's interesting. Maybe I'd like to catch up and see what's going on there. So in some cases, a lot of there, there's, there's an internal initiative to create a cloud, um, a, a plan to go to cloud, and the security function is, has to catch up and adjust to it. That's, that's sort of one scenario. Another way it sometimes happens is someone says, hey, cloud is faster, cloud is easier, cloud is less expensive, let's do cloud and they create a program, and they start to go off, but, but, but someone says, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's, let's ask security early on. And security sometimes says no. So of course security gets blamed for standing in the way of business process innovation and doing cool things, and everybody hates them even more, and um, that's no good. Or people say, hmm, that's nice security, we're gonna do it without you. So again, the security function has to catch up. There's a theme here that's beginning to emerge. I'm sure you're, you're noticing. And this is one I've seen, the next one is the one I've seen probably the most. The CEO or the CFO suddenly notices that your organization is doing cloud way more than, than he or she knew this was going on. Maybe it gets a bill from a provider. Maybe the, the spend with a specific provider has risen to a certain level that the, it gets a C level of attention. Uh, Maybe there's a number of expenses from the same place that add up, but whatever the case is, the executive says, hey, wait a minute, why are we spending so much on cloud? And then comes a phase where the company creates an intentional strategy about cloud, the key word here being intentional. A lot of folks end up in cloud because uh, it, it was easy, it was accidental, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But again, in this particular case, the company just went to cloud without even discussing it with the rest of IT and the security function has to catch up to what's happened. And, and, and that's one of the big themes here. The, the, the power of cloud, particularly third-party cloud providers, and I'll use Amazon as an example, they've made it so easy to sign up for new compute, new storage capacity, that what they have essentially done is they have allowed people that have historically had nothing to do with IT to become players and owners in IT without any of the training, without any of the experience. That's a good thing but it's also presents some challenges, particularly from a security perspective. So the point here is that either way, no matter which of these scenarios, and I'm assuming some of these resonate with you guys, whichever these scenarios happen, you're not alone. You know, security is, is typically not considered early on. It's added as an afterthought, it's perceived as a roadblock, and so what I'm gonna talk to you today about is the ways that clients adopt cloud, there's five phases that we, that we look at and, and address. Um, things to consider at each phase. Things, what about when you're too big for cloud? Sometimes that happens. And it's something that you need to think about as you're moving into this phase. Uh, we'll discuss the shared security responsibility model. Um, 
and we should talk about managing your cloud security. I should also add during this presentation, if there are questions, if there are comments, please make it interactive. I don't have uh, a full hour. I didn't plan, let me say it this way, I could certainly talk for two hours if you wanted me to. But I didn't plan an entire uh, uh, hour's worth of, of content, so please feel free. We did a session yesterday that was uh, really interactive, had some great questions during the process, so it was good. Feel free to encourage that. So one of the things we did at SecureWorks is we went and talked to a lot of our clients. And we said, where are you with cloud adoption? Put the security part aside for the minute, although we were talking to the security professionals. We said, how did your company come to be a cloud? Where are you with this? And we charted them all and we mapped them all and we see this sort of red line. The bottom part of this is I've got an on-premises data center. The top part of this is I'm using a third-party cloud to, do the, to, to, to host some of my work streams. And what we saw is there really were five different phases that clients could be mapped into. The first phase we've called plan, which is you've got a traditional data center. It's been virtualized. I think most people are at that stage. But you, you know that cloud is, is probably somewhere in your future, but you don't have a specific plan to deal with it. You don't have a specific plan to go there. The transition phase is when you've recognized the need to a plan, for a plan, perhaps through one of those scenarios I just mentioned earlier, and you've begun to put one together, but you haven't really moved work streams into the cloud yet. It's more thinking about it. Um, and, and this is where you get your likelihood of the shadow IT. And I'm going to you know, pick on marketing for a minute as an example, and I'm not like, suggesting this always happens, but um, you know, an example is uh, marketing says, hey, I need a new landing page for this part of our website because we've got this really awesome campaign that we're pursuing. And you know, IT has told me it's going to take them 60 days to, to set this up, but you know, I don't have that much time. The, 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 the campaign's going to be over in 45 days. So I'm just going to go out to Amazon Web Services, set up a public IP address, slave it to my website, put up some content there, and we'll be good. And that's fine. That's actually a very adequate and appropriate use for that. But you need to think about the security implications of this. And so without a plan, without a structure, this is where you get pieces of the organization that go off and, and, and do whatever they need to do to get their jobs done, because that's their justification, right? I need to get my job done. And Amazon, as an example, not the only provider, of course, but, but as an example, has made it so easy to do that, that's where you get situations like that. In the, the, we call the third phase here sort of departmental or, or development oriented. And what, in, what you're doing in this phase is you've begun to move work streams into the cloud, but you've typically done it on a project by project basis. You've maybe taken a few in-house applications that you've developed and you've moved those into the cloud. Or you've started developing a new product and actually used the compute and storage in the cloud to actually do the development. Whatever it, is you, you, your, whatever it is your organization does, you've begun to do a few of these things in the cloud. And the, this thing is, is denoted specifically by the fact that you, you probably haven't begun to design for the cloud yet. You've simply just forklifted things over from one place to another. Uh, so this is typically how people go through good learning. Uh, and there's no formal security architecture. There's sort of a, uh, in many cases, there's a, a, a private network that's VPNed back to your corporate network and it just didn't sort of that may not have external access and, and, and all the security controls are just handled by whatever you've got in place in your traditional data center. That's typically how this is done. The all-in phase is the thing where you've, and what I, don't, what I mean here is, is not that you have put everything in cloud. What it means is that you've, you've figured out how to incorporate the use of cloud into your, into your IT processes and security processes across the board. So for example, think about what it does in your organization if you want to requisition a new, a new phone or a new laptop or something like that. A similar process here, there's a security architecture. Uh, there's a, a way to deploy things to the cloud. There's a specific process for employees to request it. So that marketing example I just gave, instead of going right to Amazon, they would come to whatever internal resource exists and they would request space for a landing page and it would come with the appropriate security controls and they would not be allowed to be put it on a public IP. You would have to have some sort of other routing to go there. There would be patching, there would be uh, consideration of, of, of the, the level of traffic and what data is there. So there's a whole process here. We, we did a lot of um, interviews with, I don't know, uh, several dozen clients, large and small. We found relatively few were in the all-in phase. There was one specific financial institution that just blew us away. 
they had a, a beautiful pro internal process for, for clients to be able to come, I say clients, for internal employees or departments to be able to come and request specific compute, specific storage. You asked how much you wanted. They had some questions about what it was you were doing. Is it compute heavy? Is it storage heavy? And they would give you a, a predefined block of stuff that would that you could use. You were given access to it. There were specific roles and responsibilities. And it was all attached into their security stack in a way that, that made sense. So it was really nicely done. I have seen relatively few companies get to that point yet. But they did a really good job with that. And this one, this too big part, if you look at SecureWorks uh, marketing literature, you will not see the too big phase listed there because it's really not germane to the conversation we're having with clients. But for you guys, it was important, I felt it was important for you to understand that there are situations where you reach a certain scale where cloud doesn't necessarily yield the financial benefits that you think it should. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but it, you know these are the sort of the five phases that we've seen. Any, any comments, questions on this? Okay. Does this seem crazy, or does this make sense? You can sort of make sense. All right. So as I mentioned before, with those scenarios at the beginning, they're kind of a two epiphanies or aha moments that people tend to have here. The first one is, hey, we're spending a lot of uh, money on cloud already. We should have a plan. You know, I, we know it's coming, but wow, we just realized that we're spending a whole bunch of money on this when we hadn't really known we were doing this. And hey, this cloud really delivers a lot of advantages. We should have a plan. So, so the epiphany is that you need to start going into that planning phase. The other epiphany that some companies have, not everybody, but some companies <laughs> is that, hey, wow, this isn't yielding the financial benefits that we thought it would. Uh, maybe we should bring this back in-house, or maybe we should consider moving to another cloud service provider. Or maybe we should consider leveraging spot pricing a little bit more effectively. It really depends on the nature of your organization, the nature of your business, the nature of the applications you're putting in cloud. If you're, a, I don't know, a consumer-driven retail organization and pennies really do matter, you know, spot pricing may be the way to go. And you may want to design your application for uh, agility and mobility. But if you're not, um, it, it maybe there's another approach that makes more sense. Uh, but we do know of some clients that we that SecureWorks has that we talked to that said, hey, you know, we went to cloud, we came back in because at the scale that we operate, if there's something that breaks, we just rip it out, throw it in the garbage, and put another one in. I mean, we have this this room full of spares over here. We know the the mean time to f between failure. We know how it's going to break. We know what we to do, and we've done all the math, and it makes more sense for us. I'm not saying everybody will get there, but it's something to think about as you're designing your approach to cloud specifically when you think about it from a security and data retention perspective. We'll talk about that in a second. So for the five phases, what are some security things to think about as you're going for these phases? Well, at the plan phase, you, you certainly want to think about a security reference architecture. What is it you're doing in the cloud? Is it development? Well, if you're doing development, then you're going to do a cert, you're going to put up security architecture a certain way. If you're doing deploying production stuff into the cloud, you're going to want to ask what it is that you're putting out there, and you're going to want to protect it a certain way. So you're going to want to look at your own security architecture that you have in-house and figure out the best way to extend it into the cloud. Um, I suggest you talk to multiple cloud providers. Don't just stick with one. Keep your, keep your options open from the, from the beginning, because I think it's very important that you not necessarily get locked into one environment. Um, each of the cloud providers is beginning to put a lot of really cool stuff out there. Again, I'll pick on Amazon. Uh, they have some really good APIs. They have some really good capabilities. You should use them. But if you do and you build your structure around that, that's not going to port over to a Google or a Rackspace or wherever um, you know, when the time comes to do that, if it's necessary. And this last bullet is, I think, the most important of the three that you see up here. Create a governance model. And I'm sorry, I hate that word. It sounds like... <coughs> process and auditors and reviews. I don't mean it that way. But what it means is have a well-thought-out process for org deciding at the organizational, at the executive level, what data is OK to go in cloud and what data is not. When we talked to our clients uh, back at SecureWorks, we found that a lot of our clients uh, were in the process of creating that data model. And so we had certain clients who had the crown jewels. This stuff was just absolutely positively never allowed to go in cloud because if we lost us, our business would be over. The rest of the stuff, maybe that's okay. 
So that's one of the things that we, you, know, you need to think about, and this is the most important bullet on the slide, is we think about what data should go into cloud and what data shouldn't. It's mostly that last part. And think about that intentionally. Be ahead of that decision. You know, you'll find, particularly if you have shadow IP, that there may already be data in cloud that you didn't expect to be there. Now, one of the questions that came up in an earlier session was, what about SaaS? Right? So I'm talking about infrastructure as a service a lot here and platform as a service. But what about SaaS? Hey, you know, Salesforce.com is out there. We have our client data already in cloud. Yeah, you do. You have employee data in cloud, probably. You have a lot more data in cloud than you think. And this is why this, this conversation needs to be had. And it's not just about this, the work streams that you're building internally and moving into an infrastructure as a service cloud. It's also about you know, what you're putting in there in SaaS. From a transition perspective, reconsider the, as you, as you start to move into cloud, reconsider the architecture of your stuff, whatever it is you're putting in the cloud. Um, you know, Netflix is a classic example of a company, and they'll, they've been very open about their architecture. They've, they've got some really cool stuff that they do. But, you know, they originally just moved their servers over into the cloud, their applications, but then they realized, mm, boy, there's a better way to design for cloud so that I can take advantage of the elasticity and so I can, I can take my application and divide it into smaller and smaller pieces so that I can more easily manage the capacity. And so think about the design of that. Um, test your applications once they're in the cloud. Pen test them, red team test them, vulnerability scan them. Make sure that you are looking at them as aggressively as you would look at your own applications in the traditional data center. Um, and we'll talk about more of that in a second. And again, extend your security operations model into the cloud. Now, your operations model probably needs to adjust to the realities of cloud, but at this phase, just make sure that you're thinking about doing what you're doing for your traditional data center for the applications that you are moving to cloud. Just make sure that you've thought that through. If you do scanning and patching regularly internally, then you should do scanning and patching regularly here. Once you start getting applications into the cloud, you know, the, the point I want to make here is you generally care about the same kind of controls in the cloud that you do in your traditional data center. It's the same issues. You want to make sure that you understand the threat landscape. You want to make sure that you, under, you have sufficient visibility into your environment. You want to make sure that you know who's doing what and what's going on. You want to be able to identify anything that seems anomalous or suspicious, and you want to be able to investigate it thoroughly so you can figure out if there's a problem that you need to address. And you need to make sure that you're doing the same things regularly to strengthen and shore up your defenses wherever it makes sense. It's the same security controls. There's a little bit of variation there because you have another player in the mix, and you have to account for that. But I think it's important that you think about that and, 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 and look at all of your security controls and ask yourself proactively how these get mod moved over. You should also consider how your security model morphs as you move into cloud. So how many of you have heard of the, the pets versus cattle metaphor? Have you heard this? So the idea is that um, in your traditional data center, your servers are like pets. You've bought the hardware. You name them. You care about them. When they're sick, you make them better. You love them. But in the cloud, they're numberless, emotionless drone entities. And if something is uh, sick, you, this sounds cruel, you just say you deprovision it rather than shoot it. <laughs> you you deprovision it and you send up another one. So for example, here, in the case of, of patching and scanning, right, you want to make sure that you're scanning regularly. But if you find a fairly serious vulnerability that, say, it touches the applications tier of your web application, instead of going and patching all those virtual images, you patch the gold image, you deprovision all the old ones, and you repopulate it with the new ones. Much easier, actually. <laughs> So uh, think about how your security operations model morphs. And the other thing I want you to think about here is incident response and incident response preparation. Now, one of the things that every new CIO should be thinking about when they take a new job is that they should consider whether or not they should, they should consider their new IT infrastructure to have been breached already or is about to be breached. I know that seems harsh, but that's the reality of the world we live in today. It's, prevention is important, defenses are important, but preparation for, for, for having a compromise incident or having something that needs to be investigated is just as important. And so when you're, and you should, by the way, if you're not doing this for your traditional data center, you should be doing the same thing as well. But when you're going into cloud, 
Pay special attention. Think about what you would do if there's an incident. How would you know, first of all, and secondly, what would you do if it happened? Suppose one of your, uh, you know, in your uh, web server images, somebody, somebody's broken into one of your, 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 uh, your servers. Well, I mean, the, you know, the initial response is to try and sort of kill it and fix the patch and make sure that doesn't happen again. But, well, wouldn't you like to know why that one? Wouldn't you like to know how it happened? Wouldn't you like to know what they're after? These are the things you need to think about. Wouldn't you like to know what to do to keep it from happening again? So these are things to think about when you're moving into the cloud. It's very important to start thinking about this at this stage. From an all-in perspective, in theory, you've, you've, you've taken your security operations model. You've got it robust enough. All the requests for compute and storage are take place in the context of a security uh, reference model. So it should be fully implemented. This is where forensics readiness is important. Forensics readiness is a little bit harder in the cloud than it is in your traditional data center because the devices that may be compromised are typically virtual and may be ephemeral in nature. They may vanish. So it's very important that you think about um, how you do this and, and, and are you ready for this. This is also where your relationship with your security provider, your, sorry, your, clouds, your cloud service provider, this is where that comes into play as well. Make sure that you understand how they're going to work with you in the, in the presence of an incident. And from a too big perspective, again, this is where you know you. <laughs> this is where you've got security for pets versus security for cattle, uh, and and really the things that matter at this point, everything matters. You've got a, a, a full blown security architecture. It's all in house. But this is where you pay particularly attention to incident response and and particular attention to, um, to to threat intelligence to make sure that you understand how the threat landscape is changing and how your security model needs to defend against that. So any comments or questions on this? I know this is a sort of a, a high level, sort of lightweight approach here, and I've got some more data for you in just a moment, but comments, questions? Okay, I know it's early and the coffee's two floors down. So I've been doing security, cloud security presentations for four years, and if there's one thing I want you to remember, it's this. It's that you, and there's this slide and the next one, I should say, that's not fair, that's two things. If you have a cloud, well, let me say it again. When you use a public cloud provider or even a, a third-party cloud provider that may be in a private cloud mode, you are essentially outsourcing some slice of your cloud infrastructure to someone else. In a traditional data center, I'm assuming most of you are either security professionals or security-related professionals. In a traditional data center, yours is the throat to choke from everything from the power coming into the building all the way up to the applications that are being provided. There's one owner there. Here, depending on what you've licensed from the cloud service provider, there are multiple owners. From an infrastructure as a service perspective, you're getting, you know, in some cases, a bare metal hypervisor. The cloud service provider owns the physical security of access to that building. They own the security of the physical box and the power and the doors. They own uh, the security of the hypervisor. But you own everything above this. So I want that the key point here is that just because you've gone to a cloud service provider, it doesn't alleviate, it doesn't remove the responsibility for you to, to secure these environments. Oops, sorry, let me go back. Um, from a platform as a service, you know, you're going to get you're going to get the, uh, the operating system and maybe an application environment, depending on what it is you've licensed. But you've still got to secure the application and the associated data. And from a SaaS perspective, even if you're using a Salesforce.com or a Concur or a Teleo, you still have responsibility to make sure that the data is secured and that the people who are accessing it are the right people. And that when an employee leaves the company, that you've deprovisioned his or her Salesforce.com account as well you still have a pretty serious responsibility here. And that's one of the reasons why shadow IT and the movement into cloud, particularly for SaaS, can be challenging because it represents an unknown set of security risks for, for, for organizations and companies, particularly as it relates to data. So this is the sort of the, I'm sorry, this is the, sort of the money slide here, I guess. But the thing I want you to take away from this is cloud providers generally have absolutely excellent cloud security infrastructure or security. Clouds, I didn't say that right. Cloud infrastructure security. 
Really, it's awesome. I've seen presentations by Amazon and Google about the things that they do. They, they take your data and they shard it across multiple drives and multiple locations, and they have crazy names on it. And so even if you were to get access to the system, you wouldn't necessarily know what you'd have, and you only have part of it. Like taking your old credit cards and chopping them up into 18 pieces and throwing them in two different trash cans, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's the same kind of story there. But that is designed to protect them. It is not designed to protect you. You have a responsibility to make sure that you secure this environment. And so security of your applications and your data is your responsibility. If you put an unpatched Windows operating system, not picking on anybody, but it's just the classic example, Windows Server on a publicly facing IP, it will be owned in minutes, if not seconds. And it will begin to do something unpleasant to someone else, usually. And that someone else will then say, hey, what's going on? They'll look up the IP address of the system. They'll find that it belongs to your cloud service provider. They'll call your cloud service provider. And the cloud service provider will probably take your application and put it in some sort of purgatory where it cannot access the internet, but, but you can access it via VPN back to your data center. They've basically taken you offline until you fix it. So I've seen this. I've seen a lot of people say, oh, wow, they have great security. I can just, I don't have to worry about it. I'll just put that up there. And I remember what I said earlier. These cloud service providers have done an excellent job of allowing people who don't have a lot of experience with IT to start playing around with IT. And so you get that. They say, oh, look, I see that the Amazon has great security. They do. I'm fine. I don't need to worry about it. I'll just put it up there. But that's not true. Very important. Does this make sense? You guys are good with this? All right. So how do you manage your cloud security? There's two options. <clears throat> As I mentioned, um, this is not a sales pitch. So, you know, we have a lot of clients at Dell SecureWorks who do their cloud security themselves. Perfectly fine. Lots of ways for us to help, but uh, public cloud security infrastructure must be managed and monitored just like everything else. 24 by 7, you have to have the visibility of what's going on, you have to know who's doing what, and you have to be able to assess your resistance to threat, and you have to be able to understand the threat landscape as it's changing. Those are sort of three primary components of a sound security strategy. You can certainly do all this yourself. If you're going to do this yourself, here are 10 things for you to consider. These are by no means the only 10 things for you to consider. But these are 10 sort of important lessons that we've learned over the years. The first thing is really make sure that you understand the nature of your relationship with your cloud service provider. So make sure you understand where your responsibility ends and theirs begins. Have clarity on what you're going to do and they're going to do with them. Understand how they're willing to work with you. Understand the role they play in security. Understand their security and their limits on liability. So for example, let's suppose that you put some really important data in the cloud and it was stolen and the damage to your business was material. Maybe it was client data. Maybe it was employee data. Maybe you had to go through an incident response or a, a breach remediation. Maybe that cost you or organization I don't know, two, three, four million dollars. Just making that up. That, that would be actually a relatively small one. The cloud service provider, if it's traced back to some sort of flaw somewhere there, they're going to tell you their limits or liability is going to be typically capped at what you paid them. So it's really important that you think about this and that you go into that understanding that and that you make intelligent decisions about what data can go into the cloud in this context. So I know I don't like to go all legal on you, but this is one of the most important things you need to think about is what's your relationship with these guys. Make sure you have the right to audit your environment. And when I say audit, I mean this in the broadest possible sense. It's not just having an auditor come in, but if you have PCI or HIPAA compliance requirements, make sure that you understand the implications of going to a third-party cloud. A lot of the providers are getting very good at giving you some good documentation about how they support this. But also, you have to have the right to scan your environment. A lot of them didn't do that. This was years ago, so it's not as much of an issue anymore, but uh, most of the time you can scan your environment now. But make sure that you have the right to do anything that you need to do from a security and compliance perspective in this environment. Make sure your data and applications are mobile and not locked into a proprietary format. This is particularly pernicious when it comes to SaaS providers. There's, I mean, how, how do you pull all your data out of salesforce.com, for example, if you wanted to? It's the question that most people don't ask, but you may choose to move it at some point. And let me tell you, from a negotiations perspective, it's always good to have a couple of vendors ready to support you. You'll get a much better price that way. 
Make sure you have a method for retrieving or removing your applications and data. Same thing, right? Make sure you can get it out. Suppose you want to change. Suppose you want to bring it in-house. Suppose you want to go to another provider. Make sure that you have a way to get this stuff out. Encrypt your data where possible. Encrypt your data where impossible. Ensure your cloud provider does not have the keys. This is a little harder, right? So there's a lot of cloud providers say, I'll encrypt your data for you, no problem, if they have the keys. That means they have your data. And again, back on the first one, also think about what, what, are, what are the cloud providers' security, how do, how do they hire? What are their background checks? Do you have an insider threat problem with the cloud service provider? If, the, if your data is encrypted and they don't have the keys, that takes care of a lot of that right there. But then you've got to figure out how you're going to manage that data, right? So do you bring it back to your data center and, and put it in memory and decrypt it there and do all the management there and send it back? Well, that kind of de defeats the purpose of having elasticity of compute. It depends on your application. It depends on your need. It depends on the data but I, I, I want to strongly encourage you to encrypt your stuff. Monitor everything, server activity, user activity, device activity, data in motion. The more visibility you have in this environment, the better off you are. Now remember, cloud environments, depending on the nature of how you use them, are much more dynamic. It's like browning in motion. It's like molecules bouncing all over the place, right? It's, it, in some cases, harder to, to, to manage. On the other hand, it's a little bit easier if you come back up a level. Instead of looking at individual server instances, maybe you look at what groups of servers are doing, because these are going to be 100 servers that are exactly the same. Oh, wait, number 57 isn't exactly the same. Why is that? What's happened there that I should know about? And what's that user doing? You know, you've got, if you go to an Amazon, for example, again, I keep picking on them because I know that example the best. But if you go to an Amazon, they'll give you a root account, essentially effectiveness of a root account. Don't use that account. I think this is my next example, actually. Don't let anyone use that account. Take that account, one person who's got it, put it off in the corner, give everybody else an appropriately provisioned least privilege account. Oh, look, there it is, least privilege account. Um, and tie this into your identity and access management system. This is also true, by the way, for, oops, sorry, for your SaaS solution as well. Um, it's tie all of the authentication for, for your various SaaS properties. First of all, inventory them, and secondly, tie the authentication of these things into your, into your Active Directory or your LDAP systems so that when you add an employee, you have a conversation about what access rights they ought to have. And when you remove an employee, they are automatically removed from your Salesforce and concur into Leo instances as examples. So you don't have the situation where the employee has left the company but can still get all your data. That's, un that's suboptimal. Back up your data and applications regularly. When it's gone in the cloud, it's gone forever. Uh, as sort of an interesting anecdotal example I worked for uh, in a previous life, a company whose job it was is to replace your on-premise email systems with a cloud-based email system. And I got a call one day from uh, a, a user of, of one of these clients. He says, you know, I just took all of my email, and then this is in the cloud, and I moved it into a trash can, and then I emptied my trash can, and now I want it all back. Okay, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. You cannot have it back. What, whatever disk space was used there, what, it's, it's now being reused by someone else. You had to do two things. There was a two-step process, and you still did it. Um, but when you think about it, I mean, you, it was hard to blame the guy because that's, you, can, you can undo all that when you're talking about doing it on your laptop or on your premise. But no, it's not there anymore. And, and this is important. You know, there are other things that can happen. There are outages. There are, I haven't actually seen this happen, but you know, s subpoenas to come and take racks of stuff that might have your stuff on it. So there's lots of different things to think about here. Backup and, and backup is good. It also helps you with forensic stuff as well, forensics of readiness, making sure that you have snapshots of what's going on there on a regular basis. Have an incident response plan. Have adequate forensics data. Forensics in the cloud can be Perhaps harder is too strong a word, but trickier and more, more complex because there's more moving parts because there are a, there's a provider that may have to get stuff for you. Um, you may need their help getting logs from their firewall, for example, for the time in question. Uh, or there may need to be some, some, some access granted to, to certain people. So very important that you, you have a plan in place. 
And finally, and this is a this is a thing that often surprises people, make sure you budget for your security infrastructure, not just buying the stuff, but running the stuff. Because remember, <clears throat> in a third party cloud, you have to pay for the compute and you have to pay for the storage and you have to pay for the net out associated with everything that you do there. And so if I buy, you know, so one, one model that a lot of clients do is they'll stand up a, a, a VLAN and they'll run all their security stuff in that and they'll pass all their traffic through that VLAN to whatever other applications are going in. So they'll have a, uh, an IDS and a WAF and a, and, a, and a firewall and maybe some other stuff going on there. That stuff is going to be running all the time. It's going to be chewing up compute cycles 24 by 7. You're probably not going to get as much uh, sort of elasticity or utility-based pricing in that. You might, depending on what it is you're doing on the other side of the, of the fence there. But um, make sure that you budgeted for that. You don't want anybody to get a nasty surprise. Does that all make sense? Okay. So option B is you can have someone else help you with it. This is not intended to be an ad, but this is an example of uh, some of the services that Dell SecureWorks offers to assist clients with securing their cloud infrastructure. Uh, this portfolio is, is in fact specific to Amazon Web Services, although we do offer a similar portfolio for uh, VMware-based environments as well, which typically tend to be more private cloud and, and, and hybrid cloud environments. So um, have a look at this. I'm not going to walk you through that. Uh, but there are additional resources to be had uh, at some various places. Uh, so you can go have a look there if you're interested in more information. That's all I had to tell you this morning. So happy to take any questions, comments. Yes. Yeah, these, these services, um, the question was, are these available for other environments? So AWS is our first. So we have VMware. AWS is our first sort of highly elastic public cloud environment. Azure is absolutely on the roadmap. In fact, many of these services here, these security and risk consulting services, as well as these incident response services, can be delivered into Azure environments. These here typically require us to build something from an engineering perspective specific to the environment. So, for example, oh, see, I did it again. Um, so, for example, here, for monitoring elastic server group logs, for example. We're using some Amazon-specific APIs to do it, and we've, we've, we've built a, 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 a virtual appliance that consumes and processes the logs. So we have to do that same work for Azure. We just haven't done it yet. Other comments, questions? All right, well, I will say thank you for your time. Very, very, thank you very much for your time this morning and for getting up so early on a rainy morning and uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you.